here we have a famous theorem of Brouwer, namely Brouwer's fixed point theorem in the special case for D2. So here D2 is a two-dimensional disk, so you can think of D2 as just being the circular disk, including the boundary, but also everything inside. And we have a map that's taking D2 to D2. So here we have a map F. And the Brouwer's fixed point theorem in the case for D2 states that when I have a continuous map of this form, then F has a fixed point. There is at least one point that's being mapped exactly to itself. So this is a fascinating theorem. One way you can think of this is D2 as being, say, a pool of water. So this is filled with water. And think of putting your hand in, or putting in a spoon, say, and you shuffle it around. So the water molecules are going to move around. So I guess one way, one way you can do this is by rotating every molecule, say, 30 degrees counterclockwise. So you can just rotate the, rotate the water here. And in this case, we see clearly that after when we stop after rotating by 30 degrees, that the point at the center, so if I look at the point right here at the center, then that is a fixed point that's being mapped to itself. But what Brouwer's fixed point theorem is telling you is that no matter what you do, when I look at the starting point at, at the ending point, there is going to be a fixed point somewhere in the disk. And that's a, that's a fascinating, fascinating theorem. So how do we go about proving something like this? Well, there are many approaches. There is one using combinatorics. There is one way using differential topology. But the proof that I want to sketch today uses one ingredient from algebraic topology. So here is the ingredient that we are going to assume. So we're going to assume that if you look at S1, so S1 is a one-dimensional sphere or just a circle. So S1 is just the boundary of D2. So it's just the circular boundary, nothing inside, nothing outside. So if I just look at the circle S1, so remember D2 is including everything inside, S1 is just the boundary. And I look at the loop that goes around S1 exactly once. So con consider this path that's just going to circle around. So it starts at this point, you circle around once and you stop at the same starting point. I claim that this loop, so this loop here, cannot be continuously deformed into a constant loop. Okay, what do I exactly mean by this? Well, I'm not going to make it super precise, but just to get you some idea of what I mean, consider a circle, so S1 once again, and now consider a loop that again has the same starting point, but now goes something like this. It moves along this direction, but it goes right back. Now in the case of this loop, this can clearly be continuously deformed into a constant loop by simply shrinking it in. So what I mean by this is that as time is passing, what we can do is we can simply sh shrink this in continuously like this. So initially you have a loop that goes like this, then in the next half second say, then you're going to shrink it in, so it's only going halfway, then you're only going to go like 25% of the way, and you can keep on shrinking it, deforming it continuously until, until we get just a loop that's going to stay in the same place or throughout. So you can imagine, initially you have this loop, then a little while later you have this loop, then you can consider keep on deforming it until we just get a constant loop. Now the claim here, which we're not going to prove, but is hopefully intuitive, is that if you consider this loop, then you cannot continuously deform it into a constant one. Like, how can we do so? We can try maybe wiggling around the loop a little bit to make it something like this, but that's not going to reduce it to a constant one. In fact, proving this is actually quite tricky to admit, but given this fact, what I want to show today is how you can get a simplification to Brouwer's fixed point theorem, how we can prove this theorem assuming this fact. So how do we do so? Well, let's suppose for the sake of contradiction that we have a map. There exists a map from D2 to D2 without fixed points. And I will show you that something, something goes wrong. So we have a map from D2 to itself without fixed points. And now I'm going to give you a map, an interesting map from D2 to S1. So here S1 is again the boundary of D2. And I will construct a map from D2 to S1 that satisfies a very interesting property that we're about to see. So what we're going to do, consider any point in D2. So let's say we have some point P here. Well, we apply F to that. We're going to get some other point 
in D2, that's different from P because if P is not going to be a fixed point. So when I apply F, I'm going to get some point F of P in D2. And now to define phi of P, what we are going to do is we're going to draw a ray that's starting at P and it's going to point in the direction of the vector from F of P to P. And of course, this makes sense because P is not a fixed point. And now what we're going to do, we're going to define phi of P to be the first point that this ray is going to intersect S1. So that defines a map from D2 to S1. And now there are some things to notice about phi. First thing is that this phi is a continuous map. And to informally argue this, realize that if we move away infinitesimally from P, then because F is continuous, that means the value of F, the output of F, is going to move away infinitesimally close to F of P. And that's going to result clearly in the value of phi that's infinitesimally away from this green point. So hopefully that convinces you that phi is continuous. But now the interesting property of phi that I want to turn your attention to is that if we consider a point P in S1, so if I consider a point P lying in the boundary of D2, then this P is actually going to get mapped to itself under phi. And the reason is simply because if we consider the ray starting at P and in the direction of this phi of p to p vector, so if I consider this ray, then certainly the first time this ray is intersecting S1 is at p. So we know that any point in S1 is getting mapped to itself under phi. Now, how do we finish? Well, we have this map from D2, so D2 is including everything inside, to S1. So here, S1 is just the boundary once again. So we have this map, phi. And here is something to realize. If I consider the loop that goes around S1 exactly once, so this purple loop that we were considering before, then when I map this loop under phi, then we are going to get the same loop in S1. And that's simply because any point in S1 is being fixed under phi. So we have, see that this purple loop is going to this purple loop identically. And now something to realize is that this purple loop can be deformed continuously into a constant loop in D2. Remember, we cannot do that in S1, that was a fact we were assuming, but in D2, we surely can. And that's because, that's because, as time is passing by, we can use all of this extra space in D2 to shrink it in. So we can shrink it a little inward like this, then we can shrink it even more like this, because we have the space in D2, until we get a constant loop here. So this is happening over time. Initially, we have this loop, and over time, we're shrinking the loop in until we get a constant loop. But now something to realize is that we can apply this map phi at each time. So initially, applying phi got us this exact same loop in S1. And applying phi a little while later to say this purple loop, I mean, it's going to be a loop in S1. Maybe it's going to look something like this. I'm not super sure. And then we're going to get some loop in S1 here, but we know that by the end, we are going to get a constant loop. That's simply because if we start with a constant loop and you map it under any map, really, we are going to get a constant loop. And now what do we have on the right hand side? Well, we have a way of continuously deforming this purple loop in S1 to a constant one. And we know that's a contradiction because we assumed that was not possible. So. Now, going all the way back up, we can conclude that assuming that this f without fixed point exists, we got a contradiction. So Brouwer's fixed point theorem must be true.